So on page 21, it states that uh, Joshua, one of the authors, mum dies and leaves a lot of items. Um, when the time comes, will you be able to get rid of your parents or any loved one's stuff or will you look to put it all in storage? Um, I think that's a very good question, actually. I mean, at the time of listening to it, because I, I didn't read it, I thought to myself, um, not getting rid of things, but yeah, let, let's say getting rid of things. Getting rid of things shouldn't be that difficult. I don't think I'm a hoarder. I, I do like to keep trinkets and, and memories. I think those things are important. And I know they made reference to actually taking photos of things um, and things of that nature. I think your parents' stuff, as in his case, it might be a little bit difficult, but I think you're probably going to have to apply some of the same principles as to not hoarding and keeping the things that were important to you. Maybe a few things that are important to her as well. But at the same time, obviously, you lived with her, so a lot of those memories will live in you. Or a lot of, sorry, I, I say her as in your mother, but I mean your mother and your father. A lot of those memories will live in you. So I think there's got to be a balance, I think, anyway. All right, do you know what's mad, yeah? So I, I feel like my mum's a bit of a hoarder, yeah? And so my, both my mum's parents are now passed, and we've got this cabinet um, which sits in my, in my mum's house, which it contains like, you know, like a, you know, like something you'd pour like your whiskey or, or brandy in like, I don't know, that kind of bottle type. Say that again? Canter. The canter. I don't know, but it's like one of those things that you could just like pour out, like it's just a, a pretty little thing you could put your whiskey or brandy, like old school, you're seeing them old school movies and that, yeah, like yeah. them kind of 70s movies, yeah? And we've got glasses and stuff. And no one's allowed to touch this, like old teapots. Everyone's got that in a Caribbean house or a black house. I've got that. No, you, can't, you can't even go to the cabinet door to have a look. And I'm just thinking, all right, so... I don't know what she does with this stuff here. But, like, I'm thinking, it's just there. Does that make sense? It's just there. Yeah. And I, I do get... There. there you go. And I do get, like keeping hold of possessions like there's gonna be little little memorabilia that a hundred percent you keep hold of but you think i'm keeping hold of a big ass cabinet like that's just there I, with stuff in that i don't even think it gets glanced over it's just there almost but fair enough each of their own there everyone's different and some people maybe that having that just there reminds them of the good times maybe there's little memories associated with that that i wasn't a party to because i wasn't born yet i don't know in it maybe there's a story behind how this cabinet got bought but with me I, I don't really, I've got odd things from the past that I've held on to. Like, I've got like, this is my own stuff. Where I've got like, I've got like old school reports and I've got like, um, I've got Premier League 92, 93 season, the booklet with the stickers all filled out. But that's just like, I, I've got little things like that, but I don't hold on to a lot of old, old things. So I, yeah. in my own past, I'm just trying to, even like trying to think now, like, there's, I don't think I've hold on to too many memories. Photos are important. And the reason I say that, because, Photos is important because if I have kids, I can show them, innit? I can show them like my mum, my, my grandma, their great, 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 great. That's important. It creates legacy, it creates history, it creates an awareness of where you're from, who you are, why you're here, look at what your people look like, all that kind of stuff. That's, to me, that's important, innit? Mm -hmm. Other little things like more um, material things, probably not blankets, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I probably wouldn't hold on to those kind of things. Nothing that I have to like be putting in storage, what he done, where he, it was, sorry, what he thought about doing and then came to realisation, actually, I don't need this stuff to hold into my memories. Yeah. What, what's your... Yeah. I'm the same. I probably would get rid of majority of stuff. Um, not to sound too blunt about it, but as you, as you both said, small things like trinkets. Like, for example, my, my granddad died last year. Like, um, that's another story. But basically... From his things, I, I definitely requested to keep uh, some old jazz records. But that's because I love jazz and we both love jazz. And that's like a, a connection that I have with my granddad in terms of memories. And I think vinyls, and they're all vinyls as well. So when it comes to those sort of things, I'm a bit of a collector. Like I like to collect coins. I like to collect magazines. But not in a hoarding where it's taking up all the space and it's, it's just becoming unbearable, but more for memories and for uh, yeah, per personal satisfaction. But in regards to all of my mum and dad's stuff or close memory or close members of family, majority of things I could give away or donate or sell or do you know what I mean? I wouldn't I wouldn't keep it 
for myself and hoard it and, and put it in storage. Or if I was to put it in storage, it would be a process of letting things go eventually, rather than just not really looking over everything and just getting rid of it all at the same time. But I would definitely wouldn't have a problem in letting go because I think the, the memories are much more powerful than, than actually keeping the items and cluttering up and taking up space per se. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a good job. Um, so, speaking of getting rid of things and uh, decluttering, mm -hmm. there's a guy called Colin Wright. He's also a known minimalist that the, the guys speak of and speak um, about. He owns 72 items that could fit into a bag, and that's on page 23, which I thought was commendable. Yeah. But would and could you do this? But I, I, I caught that part. Um, the one thing I didn't question at the time, what sort of bag? Okay. No, I mean... Say so so it's, so it's a travelling bag, as I know you would probably appreciate. Or one of those big backpacks that you can put on over your bag, over your back, and just move around. Um, I think in his circumstances, I think that is probably most best. I mean, I've made mistakes when traveling in taking suitcases <laughs> and things of that nature. And you find when you're carrying a lot of stuff with you, it's actually unbearable, actually, because you don't look forward to moving around. It becomes mm -hmm. a real chore. I mean, it's, it's hard enough going from one city or one country to another. But when you're carrying a whole load of things with you, it becomes very, very difficult. So I understand the purpose as to what he's done. And once you actually embark on a trip like that, you start thinking to yourself, I don't need this, I don't need that. I ended up send, sending a lot of things back to the UK, actually, on my first trip. And on my second trip, I ended up just dashing things away. I think I actually gave some trainers away as well. Okay. What about you, Max? Um, would and could... Uh, could um, uh, could I do it? Could I do it? Would I? Okay, I'll start with it. I know which one. I'll, would I like to do that? No. And I'll say that because um, one of the things that I've that I've witnessed and I've slightly experienced when I haven't travelled as pocket pockets travelled. I haven't travelled. I've I've holidayed, but I've travelled within a holiday. And one of the things I've realized about traveling on a holiday is you miss, one of the things you miss, or when I, what I miss when I get back, because I love, I love going on holiday, but what I miss is not having a solid base. Having to constantly move, as you said, P, is a nightmare. It's just a nuisance. And I need a solid base. That's important. That's why I would not like to do it, because constantly moving with your stuff is a nuisance. I find it a nuisance. And, that's, and I remember, I've, I've explained this story before, the first time I visited Thailand many years ago was with a friend who went to U I went to uni with. She was traveling in Asia at the time. And I said, when you get to Thailand, it's one country I've always wanted to go to. Let me know. I'm going to book a flight and come over. She let me know two weeks in advance. I'm going to be in Thailand these days. I said, cool. Book the flight. When I got to Thailand, landed late at night, got to the hospital, and then she, she saw me. And I, like, she looked like she about like 40% of her former self in terms of she just looked faint. She just looked like she's done with it. It's like, and it was almost like she was chasing the whole traveling thing of, of, of um, having a great time. Like, it was almost like, I should feel like I'm having a good time. When I looked at her face, I said, you know, I can see clearly this has had an effect on you. The fact you've had to move around so much, that big luggage, you're now just doing it to tick off things. You're not actually enjoying it. And that's the fear I know, that's, sorry, that's, the, fear I, that's the fear I have with moving around constantly. And I think that's one of the things that would happen to me where I have a list, if I went away for three to six months and I had a list of things I wanted to tick off, First few months are gonna, first few weeks to a month or two are gonna be fun because it's a new experience, blah, blah. When you get used to that whole movie now, it's like, again, three days here, two days here, four days here, three days here. That's why I would not like to do it. Could I do it? Um, push comes to show, I probably could. Uh, but I haven't done it, so I can't be 100%. But would I like to do it? No. Could I do it? Possibly. Sorry, just oh. to echo um, what you said, I mean, because I've, cause I've been there. That does happen. So after a while, it becomes like, not this again, but you become tired of the same old routine. I mean, it's great going to a new hostel and meeting new people and things of that nature. But again, you, you, you miss certain things and, and there's a foundation um, to your life or let's say your former life that you do miss, which is nothing wrong with having a foundation, but you do miss it and you do want it. Just touching on just like um, having objects and things of that nature. 
where I, 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 I understand what he's done and things that I've, I've taken on moving forward from traveling, I've got things in London and things in Barcelona. The one thing I say all the time, when I'm in, Bar- like, I'm in London at this moment in time, so my things in Barcelona, I don't have many things that I've moved them into storage. I could not tell you many things. I couldn't tell you much of what I have in Barcelona. So if there was a robbery and my things were missing, I couldn't, I can barely tell you what was in those things. Barely tell you. And, and that's, does that mean it's not important to you? Is that the point? Yeah, that's the point I'm making. But I mean, I've taken, so straight, yeah. I've taken like, not very minimal things, but I've taken, I've taken a few things out there, but such is the way I've maybe, um, I've begun to live my life at this moment in time as to um, being a bit more minimalistic than I was previously. I don't hold huge value to a lot of the stuff that's actually out there. I, I recall one or two jackets um, and obviously we've laughed at my camera um, in recent time um, as to when we're zooming and things like that. I've recalled that I have a, a, a portable camera which would go on my laptop. But apart from that, I don't really know what's in, I don't know what's in Barcelona. Um, touching back on your point that you was making about your friend Mace, uh, yeah. in regards to her pursuing going to travel in a pursuit, I think that goes back to the point raised earlier about pursuing happiness. Like if mm-hmm. you're going to be pursuing those, the, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Pursuing the, the happiness of traveling, like the, the ecstasy of being able to say, oh, I've traveled and I've done this and I've done that, where you're now, because you're chasing it, it becomes more of a hindrance than actually enjoying the moments that, that come of it, rather mm-hmm. than, do you know what I mean? Just appreciating yeah. going from place to place, seeing the different experiences. But so can I just, for me, in, go on, sorry, I thought you were going to move on. Uh, in regards to answering the question, I think I wouldn't do it because, as similar to you, makes I like a base, I like my creature comforts. Um, similar to you, I haven't been traveling, but I've been on holidays, I've been to different countries, and I enjoyed having a, a permanent base or a nice hot shower to jump into, or a hot nice bath to jump into, or whatever it may be. So I, I definitely like creature comforts. Could I do it? I, I think I could. I've got the mental resistance to do it, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't put myself in that position to do it, personally. Just, just touching on, on your friend Mason, now mm. I, I can't remember how long she'd been travelling at the time, because I do know the story and I know who you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Um, I did very similar things. So when I first went away, both times, I was like, I can't wait to come back and, and tell, not tell these stories. He was almost rushing, rushing the, the end of a journey and the journey hadn't begun. And mm-hmm. what I found is just relax and just be easy. Not to say, not to say that she wasn't, but you can't, rush, you can't rush an experience. You have to live the experience. And then when you're having those great nights out or those great afternoons is when you really begin to appreciate the journey and the process and the experience. Yeah, yeah, I agree, man. Would you guys encourage your, what's on the subject, would you guys, if you were to have children, would you encourage your children to travel? 100%. 100%. 100%. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Goes about so I need to do, I need to do, I still want to do it myself, to be fair, like properly proper traveling like not just going holidays but i actually do would like to do a bit of backpacking across a couple continents yeah would you were you were either of you encouraged to travel at a young age by your parents no Did it even not, in competition? Not, not in the sense of how we're referring to it now yeah um we we went on a couple family holidays so i was aware that there's a world bigger than the ends yeah. Yeah. So I'm definitely thankful for that. But in regards to traveling, we didn't really come from that kind of family. So <laughs> yeah, it wasn't right, really yeah. something that was really uh, spoke of like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, moving forward, I know you mentioned the diff the like obviously as we said, this book's about living a meaningful life. And you mentioned Mace about the five values that they've said that is most important, those being health, relationships passions, growth, and contribution. So we're going to move on to chapter two. That's all about health. Yeah. And it starts off talking about eating and exercising. Yeah. So when you feel better, you look better, and uh, that's all compounded by a dietary lifestyle. Yeah. Do you find it easier to eliminate certain foods altogether or reduce the consistency? Um, I mean, things are... 
a habit really. So I think it takes it says it takes you in a region of two to three weeks to develop a habit. I forget the the days. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you can knock out a habit, but I think when you've been practicing it for almost a lifetime, I think it can be difficult. I mean, I, as you know, I've been doing a fast for what is called a cleanse for about for about six days now. Today, yeah, today's Saturday, so for about six days, it has been difficult. So the first day was a water fast. It was difficult at the time, but once I got to the end of the day, I thought, you know what, this ain't that bad. I actually thought I can do it for a second day, but I didn't. And I'll be honest, Wednesday, Thursday, and even yesterday have been difficult by way of I planned on doing something, and I'd be like, nah, I'm eating. Like yesterday, I I, I, I ate at some point during the day. Oh, so some point stop, the day. stop, stop, stop. P, wasn't you meant to not be eating? Yeah, but I said I was going uh, to, dep- as the week <laughs> Oh, no, no, no. Oh, you got along. Oh. No, I did say that. I said I was going to take it one day. The worst thing is you sit there and justify it to yourself. Why? So okay, you don't even speak to anyone else. You don't even get anyone <laughs> to justify it to yourself. You sit there and be like, mm, shall I have this? Shall I, shall, I, shall I have this pan of chocolate? It's not really cheating because I've been eating for four hours. Like, that's how you justify it, bro. No, no, no. So I'm glad you say justifying. I mean, because we're talking about minimalism and um, conforming and stuff like that. I don't need to justify it to anybody. Oh, I, no, no, <laughs> let me just interject one more time, just so the listeners and the viewers and the, uh, the followers can understand why I've jumped in like that. Because me, we, we've had a conversation outside of the podcast, obviously, and uh, P stated that he's going to do a water fast and he reckons he's going to be able to do it for at least a week. Which oh. I said, <laughs> the strong hold on, am I lying? Grace, am I lying? You said a week, P. You said that was your intention, a week. Exactly. So, before you butt in, you've said, all right, cool, you've done it for one day. And I said that's commendable because I, I've done that myself and I've, done, I've been able to fast without no food or no water or whatever, whatnot. And to be able to do it with water just straight off the back, I think that's commendable. So, I, I, I gave my um, hand up and applauded you for that. But then you said you was going to eat the next day, which was baffling because you said <laughs> you said you was going to look to last a week. Now you're talking about eating food. Yesterday, and everything there. Now, what's going on? <laughs> all right, so let, let, me, let me jump in. All right, so I said that was my intention to do something of a water, but I said water fast. I said smoothies and I said juicing as well. But I said I wanted to. You I, said water? No, bro. Uh, you, you, uh, you, uh, you like, you like, you like, you like, you rhetoric. You no, so I said I wanted to do that for the week. You said water right? first for the whole week. But no, but I also mentioned you. buying a fruit box and things of that nature. So I said I was going to do things. So I said as the, as the week grew on, I was going to incorporate. One or two other things. So I mentioned You're juices, adding I mentioned stuff. movies, adding, yeah. and adding things of that nature. On Tuesday morning, I said, you know what? So it's like a wasp just come in the room. I said, you know what? I'm going to, I want to break the fast. Or I made a decision to break the fast, and I was going to um, then have, like, and continue my water fast for the rest of the day, or smoothie. I did that. So Tuesday really was an, an issue. Wednesday, I'll be honest, errors were made, you know, as to... <laughs> Errors were made, and Thursday I can't, can't remember yesterday entirely, but I was I received my um, my box, my fruit box, and I was smoothie and having fruit and stuff like that. And it got towards the end of the day. I said, you know what, I can't carry this on because I, I intended, I intended. I told myself on Sunday I wanted to do a water fast, and I wanted to be as strong as possible before doing so. Um, so that so that's where I am as to the fast at this moment in time. But it's been a very good and very productive week. Cool. <laughs> Man, you're ill. <laughs> you went. I told you, I sank in my room. So I was waiting for you to get out. Uh, uh, what about you, Mace? I can't remember the question. P3. Um, do you find it easier to eliminate certain oh, food? Yeah, do you know what? I'm, yeah, food. yeah, do you know what? Do you know what's crazy? So, I just, I'm not gonna lie, I just eat what I want. Like, I don't even try and make an effort to trim down on this, um, to increase my intake on that. And it's just gonna happen that as I've got older, I've stopped, I've increased, I like, I, prefer, I like veg, if that makes sense. And I've increased my intake of veg. And I've just, I've actually gone off milk, dairy milk. I still eat ice creams and stuff. But dairy milk, I just I haven't drank dairy milk for absolutely ages, but I will eat products with dairy in it. So it's just I don't in terms of the health section of this book, there's no point looking at me because I don't change my health really. I if I if I fancy a tear and share cinnamon bun, I'm eating a tear and share cinnamon bun. 
Like, that's, that's just how it is with me, bro. That's true. I think you should enjoy yourself. It's all about balance at the end of the day. Yeah. But when it comes to... Sorry, was you finished? No, I finished. Um, in regards to, to myself personally, I think rather than cut it all out altogether... Actually, no, tell her that. It's a bit of both because... No, I would probably reduce the consistency rather than cut it out altogether. Because when I find that when I've cut things out, I tend to crave it that much more if I cut it out altogether. Whereas if I reduce the consistency of what I eat or whatever it may be, whether it's a snack or a sweet or a particular meat per se, mm-hmm. then I find, it's, I find it's a lot better. Like I'll, I may have um, uh, a packet of sweets or a cheesecake a couple weekends in a row running, and I'm like, all right, cool, let me give that a break now and have like a good month or so of not having no cheesecake, but I'm not completely cutting it out of my life, so I'm going to be craving it when I do want it. So if the time does come again when I do want it, I'll just get it because I can and I'm not restricting myself in, in any kind of way that's going to be a detriment to me personally from being happy about what I'm actually eating. So... It's a bit of a, a balance in regards to that. Uh, anything else? Pick, yeah. Yeah, I, know gonna... I mean, just in, as to myself, actually, I mean, with my health, and I make reference to this, obviously, I've, I've been doing a bit of writing. Um, my dad, and probably like maybe a few other people, even listening or within the group anyway, within us, so us, um, mm-hmm. we've had parents um, with health issues, etc., etc. And sometimes I look at the long game as to um, where they are and where I am at this moment in time and the things I need to do to address those things to avoid actually going down that road. So I guess that is a reason why I've chose to, I mean, I haven't had milk for many, many years, if I'm honest. And there's yeah. things I've tried to incorporate into, into my diet. Hence trying to fast and things of that nature to actually to see whether I have the sustainability to cut things out or to um, actually now like something which is a little bit different to what I was actually consuming before. Mm. Cool. Is there anything else on health that you guys want to touch on? Otherwise, I'm going to keep it stepping. Um, I'm going to talk on it in the book review. Um, cool. Yeah, I know they, I mean, yeah, we can talk about it in the book review, but I mean, I know they were talking about sleep, which we've discussed obviously very recently as to myself. I know we said, or certainly I said, that I was struggling with sleeping. And I've often laughed at the, the notion of sleeping for five, six hours, whereas over the past three, four weeks, if not maybe a little bit longer, I have found that I can... I, I only sleep six stroke, six stroke, seven hours and seven hours at a push. That's because I feel I'm now largely rested and I feel I don't need to sleep as much as, as I used to. Whereas I'm an individual, if I can get an opportunity to sleep nine, 10 hours and have a good old lie in, I'll do so. But at this moment in time, because I'm rested up because of the, the virus and the lockdown, I'm quite good. So it's now something I'm beginning to look at and think to myself, actually, you don't need as much sleep as I've prescribed in, in recent time. Cool. Um, all right, so moving on to chapter three, which is evaluating relationships or relationships, but the part being evaluating relationships. <clears throat> they made they they speak about making a three column list where it says name signifiers, primary, um, secondary or peripheral, effect and positive, or negative and neutral. Uh, do you guys recall what I'm talking about? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I recall exactly what you're talking about, yeah. Cool. Uh, would you take on this task and what expectations would you have? Uh, it's not a task I'd, I'd take on, actually. Um, and what I found, I don't know how it is with you guys, I just found naturally with life that being people have come closer and people have become further apart. And it's just where your mind is at. It might be your situationship, whether you've got someone, maybe because... I don't have a family, it's like kids, other people I know have got two or three kids. And just things are naturally um, to and fro. So sometimes with people I didn't speak to for like 12 months, then we're very close and then it drifts apart. It just naturally happens. And I don't, if I'm honest, I don't feel weighed down because this whole book's about releasing, removing and releasing anchors away from your life or ties away from your life to free you up, to live a more minimalistic life and, and um, relieve stress, pressure and all the rest and the environmental factors away from you as much as possible. With, with my friendships, I don't, my relationships, I don't feel like they really tie me down. I, I feel like I get up and go tomorrow and not owe anything to anyone, I have to explain anything to anyone, and no one will feel bad against me for doing that. So I, I, I wouldn't undertake this class, essentially. <coughs> cool. What about you, Pete? Um, I thought, you know, I actually agree with Mason. Um, 
I agree with Mason by way of I think your friendship shouldn't be a thing where you're constantly um, evaluating them as if there's um, something tangible um, from them. Uh, like, like, yeah, when I get from this friendship, like I, I, just, I, don't, I don't believe in that. In it, I don't buy into that. Yeah, so That's I totally agree with that. But there was, I think there was a lot of it that I actually did take from it, and I felt, um, there were, yeah, I think there's a lot of it you can take from it. And the reason why I say that because I don't, again, it depends who you are and what you want. So for me personally, there's things that I do want from life, and I think it's important to understand actually in order for that to happen you need to start evaluating things so it, it discusses um things you don't want and there are some people whether it's family and friends who i feel maybe have been unsupportive and gradually you've kind of like distanced your yourself from them so this might might not be something that i've done by way of writing it down but i've kind of undergone that task by actually telling myself actually i don't need to speak to that person anymore certainly um um just kind of limit my contact with that person because I don't necessarily need to hear that that rhetoric from them in, by way of them being actually negative of what I'm doing or just things in general. But I do think it's a, I think it's, I, don't, I think it's a, I think for maybe from a, from your own friendship circle, I don't think it's necessarily a good or bad thing. But from, if you're looking at it from maybe a career pers perspective, I think there might be something um, to be taken from it because I think it says you're generally the average of your friendship group. And I think it's important to understand that. Yeah, I think it's important to understand that. Although I think my friendship group is quite strong. Um, for me, yeah, similar, but I guess similar to you both. I wouldn't, I wouldn't get a pen and paper and note down these lists. I think it naturally progress as you, as you grow as a person. So do your social groups and social circles. So. As you said, some people some people may fade in, some people may fade out, and you just kind of take. I want to say they're rough with the smooth, but you just take it for what it is. Um, maybe you're in a different place at different times as some of your friends that you may have been close with once and moved away from. Um, and that's just the way it goes, I guess. But I don't, I don't, I don't. I probably, if anything, take a mental note of what what I not even expectation, but just the kind of relationship it is, but at the same time, I don't enter in a relationship with expectations of I'm going to get this and I'm going to get that out of it and it needs to be this and it needs to be that. It just naturally becomes what it becomes and it flourishes in, in one way or another. So I just let it be um, how, how it grows organically. Mm -hmm. uh, so cha change yourself, not others. They make a point on page 58 where it says you can't change the people around you, but you can change the people around you. And moving on slightly, seeking and selecting future relationships on page 60. Do you have a vision of what you want your relationships to be, relationships to be, and do you think you should? And before you even answer, I guess we've just kind of answered that question. Um, well, I, I know I just have it in regards to not having that common, making a column or a list of mm. positives and negatives. So uh, yeah, answering that question myself. Um, I, don't, I don't have a specific vision of what a relationship should be, but I, I know what I want from a relationship. Mm. And um, yeah, I think you should have some kind of, uh, what's the word? Not expectancy, but you should have a, a level of self-respect of okay is this person respecting my views and my morals and how i view the world and and vice versa and can they complement them and can they help me progress in whether it's socially economically or whatever, whatever type of relationship it may be but can they complement and help guide you in in being a better person and living a more meaningful life rather than it being a detriment mm -hmm. Um, just like, um, not adding to it, but drawing comparisons. So just like when we're all young and sometimes we find ourselves in friendship groups which are not necessarily um, for the best of us, which might find us getting ourselves in trouble and stuff like that. I think there comes a time and a place where you make a decision, actually, I don't think I should, not necessarily hang around with that person, but that person gets me in trouble. And if I continue to hang around with that person, it's only going to get me in more trouble. And sometimes you gradually, whether it's consciously or subconsciously, kind of take yourself out of that situation. And I think as we've all grown up, I think we've done that within our, let's say, friendship groups. And it's of no real surprise, those who have been 
let's say a negative influence on us, not necessarily negative towards us, but a negative influence. Some of the some of them have um, um, their, their their friendship groups have grown by way of the things they do, which might not necessarily be positive, and have found themselves in trouble. Whereas on the opposite spectrum, in order to be the best person you can be, you're probably going to want to do something very very similar by way of actually not hanging around, but gravitating to people who have very, very similar expectations to you. But at the same time, sharing a lot of the same thoughts that Mason, obviously, and Frenchie you've had as well, your friendship circles and your friendship groups, they generally quite come natural to you. And it's not something that you're strategic with, and it depends on your energy. Um, so there's parts of it which I, I, I take from, and then there's parts of it which I don't take from. And I'm, and I'm gathering there from the States, and I don't necessarily like saying this, but they're quite strategic with everything they do, you know, with, you know, whether it's attaching value to, to money and things of that nature. So it, it wouldn't really surprise me, um, or it doesn't really surprise me that that sort of outlook is taken. Not necessarily that it's a bad thing, um, but again, you like to kind of like make your friends a lot more naturally. What yourself, Miss? The only thing I was going to say um, was, when I, in terms of a relationship, whether that's a friendship, yeah, in terms of friendships, in the, back in the day, I might have explained this to you, one of the things that I used to do, um, and when I used to go on holiday, was not take my phone, and the other thing was, when I'd be on that flight in midair, I'd look out into the sky, into the clouds, into like, whichever city was below me, and I feel a sense of relief, and part of that was because I almost felt, um, when I was a little bit younger, I didn't, I had a lot of pressure of being relied upon and I don't think that's a good situation to be in for anyone and it made me feel tense and under a bit of pressure, under a bit of stress and it's not really a, a good relationship if someone's relying upon you and that's what I try to limit in a lot of my relationships just to be relied upon for something like I, I don't think that's a good sign I try and not exert that on anyone myself obviously there's times of need in all friendship groups, friendship circles where you're gonna you're gonna have to be there and support people whether that's your family or friends but when the fact that i used to have that sensation of feeling like to get on a flight where i felt almost a, a kind of drop in stress or a stress a stress level was because i felt like i was i would be relied upon a lot and it just and that used to be a lot of pressure and that's one of the things i think i i think that's one of the things that i've, I've kind of come to realize but anyway just my natural elevation in life it's just almost like I've gravitated away from those kind of situationships anyway. That's just that's one of the things that I would say. Cool. Um, they speak about uh, you need both in regards to commonalities and differences in relationships to make passionate relationships work. Yeah. And, and chemistry, they also mention. But chemistry, chemistry can wane, especially when you're entering a new relationship. So, so the difference in values and belief and individual needs need to be, to be spoken about and uh, almost, uh, yeah, be spoken about. And not to say agreed upon, but just know where each individual stands so you can move forward productively. I'm gonna to add to that as well. And one of the things, as you said, it speaks about like um, respecting commonalities and differences and being with someone who actually is not the same as you. And the reason, one of the reasons I say that as well is because you, have, you need to be able to, in, even in our friendship circle, with any friendship, you need to be able to challenge each other. You need to be able to challenge someone's view. You're not able to challenge. If you don't think the same, how are you going to learn and grow and develop? You have to be able to challenge each other and challenge each other with a degree of, um, uh, a degree of, of evidence almost, or kind of why you think like that. And to, to the extent where you get out of a person thinking, that's going to help you to grow and elevate and have a wider, a wider view on any topical subject. So that's one of the things I'll add to that as well, why I think that's important in any kind of relationship. The fact that you're not just all the same. You need to be able to challenge each other so that you, you enhance your knowledge and widen your view and perspective on, 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 on topics and agendas so that you don't just think the same and think you're always right because the people around you all think the same. Yeah, I mean, to add on to your point, I, I like to sometimes disagree with a point made just just to give a different perspective so it can help not just myself but the other person grow in in terms of that viewpoint on whatever the subject matter may be like even today um to be honest most of the things that we've spoken about spoken about we've agreed upon 
And that's always a good thing. But at times, I think in previous seasons, there has been times when we've had differences of opinions. And I, I definitely enjoy that because that, those are the moments that help me grow. Like, it, it allows me to know that, obviously, I know my perspective is the only perspective in the world, most definitely. But to be able to hear it and hear it from, as you said, a valid point, whether it's evidence-based or uh, feeling-based, like this is how you feel about the situation, it still allows, whether it's myself or yourself, or whoever may be inter integrating with that conversation, allows them to, to grow in and see different viewpoints. So it's very, very quickly, it just, it's a very simple point. It just goes to the point of actually having yes men around you. And they say often, when you have yes men around you, you might need to change your group. Mm -hmm. And that was, yeah. yeah, I just thought it was a very, very good, or it was just something that I wanted to add. Well, thinking of that, do you think you can be too honest in a serious relationship? Um, I don't know, actually. It depends. If honest, if you're, with your honesty, if you're intentionally trying to hurt someone, then, then I think that's a bad thing. But if your intentions are pure, then I think it's a good thing. All right. So, for, for example, you've got into a new relationship and... You've got, you've got friends around you that may be the opposite of sex and you may have uh, had a one-night fling or something of that nature where it's, got, it's, it's been physical but it's by no means a long-term physical situation. Now, you get into a situation, uh, another situation with a partner that you intend to be at long-term, would you tell that person about the, the indiscretion that you may have had with a close friend of yours? Um, I know this is kind of off topic of the whole minimalism thing, but it's just, just because you said what, 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 that, that in line of what we're saying, basically. Yeah, I probably, I mean, the type of person I am, I think I probably would. I don't like to, I don't like secrets and things. I don't like nothing that's going to surprise me out of, out of nowhere when I, when I least expect it. And I, I think I've been honest from the very beginning, then there's nothing there's nothing that's going to to hurt me down the line but just like i know mason's probably going to answer the question a good a good a good point as to what i was talking about and yes men and stuff like that so between us it's no secret that i'm writing a book so obviously i've shared a chapter recently with people who are potentially going to question what i've wrote or question my opinions and i've sent them to people who are quite um opinionated let's say and i've shared it with someone who's quite opinionated and they um wrote back to me with opinions which are not necessarily in line with mine, but are totally against as to some of the stuff that I've written. And I don't, th I, I, I don't think these things are, are have been written in spite, but they've been written almost in love. But at the same time, that is their, their point of view. And almost to an extent, it may challenge my view and my opinion and my thinking, which to an extent, I will now go back and look over what I've written. Whereas if that place, if that, if that if those viewpoints have come out of a place of malice, then that's a little bit different. Um, my answer, I'm telling straight away. I'm saying it straight away. And the reason I'm doing that is um, just be open and honest from the start. And once you're open and honest from the start, um, there's no games. There's no nine months down the line, the person finds out, why didn't you tell me? Open and honest, can you deal with that or not? If you can't deal with it, that's your problem. I'm being open and honest. So you know, this has happened in the past and that's it. Like it's happened in the past. It's, I didn't know you at the time. As simple as that. You've got to be, otherwise, nine months online, this comes out, it's like, you kept the secret for a reason, you didn't tell me for a reason. Tell it from the start. And then you make the decision at the very start, can you deal with knowing that fact? Simple, end of. I think it's that simple. And it's simple. I've done it. I'm talking from experience, and I've done it. I've been I've straight up. Mm. But, it, it caused a, a long-term rift in the relationship, unfortunately. And I'm not even going to say that it's, um, uh, it was... There's certain things that I've done within that relationship that I can say, all right, cool. Looking back on it, I could have dealt with things a lot better or I could have gone away, I could have gone about things a lot better. But I would, at the time, I was definitely like, all right, cool, I'm on this honest shit. I'm going to... Um, I'm going to... I'm gonna put my cards on the table. This is like this is what they're asking for. They want me to be honest. Like, and I'm talking about French boy. 
they want me to be honest, I'm going to be honest. I'm going to just tell you what it is, X, Y, Z. Yeah, it didn't go as according to plan as I would have liked it to, but I had a clean heart. My conscience was clear. I was like, right, do you know what? I've told you, though, you, you, want, you, want, you want to do this whole be honest with me thing. When I'm being honest, I'm getting it in the neck. So I'm not going to lie. After I did it, my, my, my next thought was, fuck this honest shit. Like, this ain't working. Like, this, this being honest stuff ain't going to work. But even in hindsight, I think there were certain things that I didn't do that I should have done that would have made it a lot easier to, to deal with at the time. So I would definitely recommend being honest as possible. But I will say there are some caveats, bro. There are some, I'm there sure are some are. situations. Yeah. yeah, I think there are some situations where I think it may be best left alone rather than being fully honest. Is my thing lagging? It looks like it's lagging. I don't know if you can see Just it. a little bit. I imagine it'll pick up though. Cool. Um, I mean, they give in the book, they give a tip on, on what to flourish your, your relationship. And I want to ask, which, would it be something that you would use to navigate in your relationships? And they, they've named it TARA, it's an acronym, yeah. and it stands for Tolerate, Accept, Respect, and Appreciate. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you guys recall what I'm referring to? Yeah. Um, yeah, would, so would you use such a, a tool, so to speak, as a way of helping in your relationships? Yeah. Yeah, without even without even having that acronym, without even putting the actual words that they've used, the tolerate, um, respect, and all that in it, it's something that if you're in a long-term relationship, it comes up as a topic of discussion anyway about whether or not you're spending too much time on your phone. We're not having enough quality time together. These things, they're inherent in most relationships. Generalizing, but they're inherent in most relationships where you'll have this. So, in terms of that tool, how they've labelled it. I haven't, I've never labelled it like that before. Let's look at Tara this evening. How are we going to improve? But you, it's those kind of, um, the principles that refer to Tara, you have those, and you, you discuss those and you work on those in your relationship anyway. So, yes. Um, I actually oh. didn't, come, I didn't come across it in, the, in, in, in listening to the book. I didn't actually come across it. So, um, I'm not fully aware of the, of the acronym. Myself, I, I think I would be receptive to it. I don't necessarily like being structured into things such as that, but um, if it's a tool that's going to help you, then I'm, I'm open ears. Cool. Um, before I move on to the next chapter about passions, is there anything else that uh, anyone wanted to discuss before we, we, we step on? No, because you know, a lot of the things I want to talk about, yeah, they actually spill over into the book review. I'm going to save it all for the book review. That's fine. That's cool. Pete? Um, no, so I mean, it talks about obviously the, the eight elements of a great, meaningful relationship for them to grow. So that's love, trust, honesty, care and support, attention, authenticity and understanding. 